Good morning again. My name is Paul Cho. I'm one of the pastors here at Village. I just want to say uh, that I'm grateful uh, to be serving alongside everyone who serves in various ways to represent Jesus and His kingdom in and through our community, including Eric and David, who were featured in the story uh, that we just shared uh, for their ministries with legal services and medical clinics. There are dozens of villagers who are ministering alongside them uh, with their professions, passions, compassion, hospitality, and services. And thank you for representing Jesus through what you do and how you live. And I must say that I was actually the very first client, an experimental case, I guess, six years ago, for the health exams for the immigration process at the village clinic by Dr. David, through which I got to stay in continuation of this ministry. <laughs> and I can imagine and pray for a multitude of Christ followers who will make impacts in the world as our community continues to participate in sowing the seeds for the kingdom. So praise the Lord for what He is doing. Uh, this month, we are in a sermon series entitled The Village Series, in which we are revisiting and clarifying our community's mission, identity, and core values. Last time we did this work was 10 years ago in 2013, and it is necessary for our community to revisit and clarify our mission and vision, for we know that God is doing something new in this rapidly changing world. Our goal is to represent the unchanging, eternal gospel truth that has been revealed in the person and work of Jesus Christ in this rapidly changing present and future world. You may find and pick up the proposed document in the lobby, which is a result of our leaderships and the community's lengthy and prayerful discernment over the past months and years. So last week, I talked about our mission, the mission of our community as we discern it to be for us. It is the great commandment, compelled by the love of Jesus, compelled by the love of Jesus. We exist to love the triune God and to love our neighbors as ourselves. Compelled by the love of Jesus, we exist to love the triune God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and to love our neighbors as ourselves. And let me also read the full official description that comes with this mission statement for our community, as I believe this captures the ethos of the mission statement as well as the summary of what I shared last week. We trust that we are invited to the life of the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, abiding in and representing the one who is love. The great commandment calls us to love God and love our neighbors as ourselves. We love because God first loved us. The love of God compels us to respond by loving our neighbors, local and global, and across all cultures. We want to relearn how, we how to love ourselves as Jesus does, both individually and collectively as Jesus' image bearers. As we love and follow after Jesus, we represent the kingdom of Jesus by being a sign and instrument of shalom through the empowering presence of the Holy Spirit. God will one day bring about complete restoration of the world and the reconciliation of all things. We will continue to actively wait for the day in participation, obedience, patience, and expectation. I love how this is described and really believe that this is where God is calling us to be. And it is my prayer that all members of our community commit ourselves for this calling. The one that I just read what is, is what is called the official version, and we have also created and, and are in the process of creating a few more, a uh, few other variations. A variation for our kids in the language concepts and expressions that are most accessible to them. A version for our youth, as well as a public version which has more easy, friendly vocabulary for those who are new to a Christian community. 
But we decided to include some Christian jargons and theological concepts in this official version because these are the language and concepts that I hope all members of our community become familiar with. So thinking about missions of a church, I really hope that we escape, we escape from the dangers of paternalistic, imperialistic, colonizing, Christendom ways of doing missions. Paternalistic, imperialistic, colonizing, Christendom ways of doing missions. For the past few centuries, especially over the past 100 years, Christians tended to describe our missions in somewhat aggressive, violent, and hostile vocabulary. In other words, we tended to assume some sense of antagonism. In other words, um, I mean, perhaps we have assumed some kind of messiahship about ourselves. For example, the world is in darkness. We are the light. They have no idea, but we have the answer. They are wrong. We are right. We must conquer. We must change and transform the world. We must expand the kingdom. We must win the lost souls. We are the soldiers of Christ. Let us fix you. Let us enlighten the heathens, the barbarians, the Muslims, the poor, the weak, for we are better, privileged, and blessed. You see, this image of the crusaders when it comes to mission these ruthless ways of doing missions for the sake of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, but in the ways that Jesus himself would, would not have done. But the way that the gospel of Jesus Christ provides existential hope in today's world is through the embodiment of the language of love, which imitates the life of Christ. In a world that is filled with hatred, Adversity, terror, conflict, trauma, self-interest, capitalistic pursuit, narcissism, exclusion, nationalism, ethnocentrism, totalitarianism, polarization, and so forth. It is the language of love, language of justice, language of peace and hospitality that Jesus himself modeled for his followers, which becomes and provides hope for the world. It is the language and message of love. Remember, Jesus said, a new commandment I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know. Everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. This is his command as well as his promise. By this, everyone will know that you are and we are his disciples. May our Lord make this promise come alive in our lives, both individually and collectively. In order to pursue this missional calling, we have come up with five core values, which indicate five principles to live by as a Christ-centered, missional, multicultural community. And they are pursuing missional life in community, deepening global gospel movement, celebrating Christian intercultural spirituality, cultivating authentic friendship, and walking together in discernment. And today I want to elaborate the second core value, what we mean by deepening global gospel movement. Deepening global gospel movement. In so doing, I think we must clarify what we mean by the gospel, the gospel. Until about a, hundred, a couple hundred years ago, uh, Christian conversation and libraries were filled with books that talked about what is the gospel. Not because people had no idea, but because of its profundity and abundance. However, if we look at the trend of titles of Christian publications these days, we are much more familiar with books like Seven Steps to Live a Worry-Free Life, Your Best Life Now, How to Get Your Prayers Answered, God's Plan for Your Financial Success, and so forth. Perhaps the culture today may have led us 
to assume that we already know about the gospel and made us move away from our continuing endeavors and humble curiosities to learn the profundity and abundance of the gospel, resulting in producing conventional Christians and Christian lifestyles. What is the gospel? I believe this is a question that we should keep asking until the last day of our life. Not because we don't know anything about it, nor because we are agnostic about it, but because of its profundity and abundance, as revealed in the Scripture, as well as experiencing the empowering presence of the indwelling Spirit of Jesus in our lives. First of all, we must be humble. We must be humble when we ask this question. Some of you might have studied and explored all the different expressions, all the different theologies, and all the different practices of all the Christian denominational doctrines, historical doctrines, as well as other religions, after which you finally concluded your religious stance and belief systems. However, most others of us came to know the Lord in a certain way, a miraculous way, or through a specific channel without having been exposed to other theologies and practices. So what we think we know today highly depends and is, lim is limited to what we have been exposed, which sometimes results in hostility to other practices without humbly listening to what others have to say. Of course, this does not mean and never mean that other beliefs are all true, as postmodern relativists might say. However, we must acknowledge that truth must be larger and bigger than what we already know because of the profundity and abundance of the gospel. Yes, Bill Bright summarized the gospel truth in four spiritual laws which I believe is a truthful and valid description of the gospel, but we cannot say that it is everything about the gospel. Please don't get me wrong. I was a Campus Crusade for Christ member at UCLA and spent my college years sharing the gospel with that tract. It is good, but we must acknowledge at the same time that the gospel is much bigger than this. I like how David Fitch, a Whitton graduate, and Scott Magnite summarized the pro Protestant Gospels of the last 100 years. I won't go in detail, but you can easily Google their articles on six Gospels. They say that there are at least six Gospels on offer today in the American churches. First, the Billy Graham Gospel of Traditional American evangelicalism. Can we have it on the screen? No. Which emphasizes that the problem is personal sin, therefore needing justification by faith alone. In this, Jesus is the personal savior of souls, which is true. Second, the social gospel, which emphasizes that evil is at work in social systems and reconstituting of the social order for Jesus' reign of goodness and love is the gospel. In this, Jesus is a prophet. Third, the liberation gospel, which, based on Jesus' Nazareth manifesto in Luke chapter 4, calls Christians to liberate the captives free in all aspects of life in response to the oppressions of the world. In, Jesus, in this, Jesus is a liberator. Fourth, the fourfold gospel or full gospel, which emphasizes the holistic deliverance of body, soul, mind, and spirit. And many Protestant, Pentecostal churches and holiness traditions, including Methodists, have emphasized this. In this, Jesus is a healer, a deliverer. Fifth, the good gospel or the neo-Calvinist gospel, which arose as a response to the cruel cruelties revealed in the world wars of the past century, emphasizing both individual salvation and social justice at the same time. In this, Jesus is a reformer. 
Sixth, the King Jesus Gospel, which is the latest development trying to embrace and encompass most of these movements based on the most recent theological discoveries and developments. In this, Jesus is the King. I bet you already had an initial reaction as well as judgment to some of these descriptions based on your own understanding and definition of what the gospel should be. I think that's natural, and that's, there's no reason to try to deny that feeling. And I agree. I also have some objections to some aspects of each definition. But perhaps a more important question to ask is, regardless of my own feelings and my own stance and preference, where is Christ indeed working in today's world? What is the scope of Christ's work? Who, literally, who is the church? When we say the global church, who are we referring to? Can we say Christ is working only with the Baptist, but not with the Methodist? Are you sure? Can we say Christ worked with Billy Graham, but not at all with Martin Luther King Jr., nor with Abraham Kuyper? Are you sure? On what basis? So it is really important to be asking these questions. What is the gospel for today? And who is the church? Who are we referring to when we say the church? Not just an individual church called village church, but also clarifying our understanding of who the universal, invisible body of Christ is in today's world. It is really important because you, each, each one of us, you are part, a part of this living body of Christ. I think it is wise to ask this question to Jesus first. Jesus, what is the gospel? How did Jesus respond to this? As you know, there are four gospels in the New Testament, and of the four, the the Gospel of Mark is believed to be the first of the four in its chronological composition. And in the very first chapter of the book, Mark 1.15, records the very first proclamation of the Gospel from the mouth of Jesus. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. The kingdom of God has come near, repent, and believe the good news. This is the very first written proclamation of the gospel in history. And of course, this wasn't a 10 seconds long sermon from Jesus, as no preacher is able to preach that short. Mark 1.15 is a summary sentence, a thesis statement, summary of all the teachings of Jesus summarized and recorded at the very first chapter as Mark the Evangelist begins this storytelling of Jesus' life and teachings. According to Jesus, the gospel is that the kingdom of God has come near. And this teaching is indeed at the center of all of Jesus' teachings as this is the very first, the very thing that the resurrected Jesus taught to his disciples when he was resurrected from the tomb, he stayed with his disciples for 40 days, and during the 40 days, what he focused on was to teach his disciples about the kingdom of God. And this is also true in the teaching ministries of Apostle Paul. Paul entered the synagogues and argued persuasively about the kingdom of God. And the book of Acts ends with this last verse, which reinforces that it is the kingdom of God that Paul and his mission team taught with all boldness and without hindrance. I want to say that the kingdom of God cannot be fully explained in a few sentences and bullet points. It is because it is a mysterion, mysterious truth, not in a sense that it cannot be known, but in a sense of its profundity and abundance. Even Jesus said and wondered, what shall we say the kingdom of God is like? Or what parable shall we use to describe it? 
not because Jesus did not know, but because of its profundity and abundance in mystery. This is why we can keep asking the question and we, why we should be asking the question continually, what is the gospel for the rest of our life? After last Sunday's message, one of you sent me an email saying, thinking about Peter's life, what was it that caused such a profound change from a person of denial to a martyr who boldly proclaimed the gospel without fear? I love the question, and I want to answer that now in relation to the kingdom gospel. I've also wondered what caused the disciples of Jesus to radically change to lives of bold and strong witnesses of Jesus compared to their previous experience of having run away at the cross of Jesus. From an image of a fugitive in the gospels, the disciples that are radically changed in the book of Acts. Some say that it is because they received the Holy Spirit. It is partially true, but does not seem to be the main reason. The Holy Spirit obviously strengthened them to be faithful witnesses, but actually they started to be faithful and strong even before the Pentecost in Acts chapter 1, whereas the Pentecost takes place in Acts chapter 2. And some others say that it is because they witnessed the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is also partially true, but does not seem to be the main reason either. Peter, even after he witnessed the resurrected Jesus, went back to the Sea of Galilee and went back to his ordinary life fishing, right? So witnessing the resurrection of Jesus did not automatically strengthen the disciples to be faithful witnesses. The only clue for the radical change can be found in Acts chapter 1, verse 3, in which the resurrected Jesus taught the disciples for 40 days about the kingdom of God, about this mystery, about this gospel of the kingdom of God. Disciples did not only witness the resurrection of Jesus here, but also started to understand the significance of his resurrection in light of the coming of the kingdom of God, in light of the gospel of the kingdom of God. They were now able to link between the resurrection and the coming of the kingdom, and this understanding of the kingdom gospel must have caused the radical change in the disciples' lives, meaning they now saw that the new kingdom has indeed broken into the world. I think it is helpful for us to understand this in light of the Jewish eschatology of the first century, meaning their beliefs of the end of the human age, eschatology. The Jewish expectation, based on their interpretation of the Old Testament prophecies, was that there will be a day of the Lord, using the language of the prophets in the Old Testament, a day of the Lord on which the present world will end and be judged and the new world will begin. Let's say that the green horizontal line represents the history of the world. There was an old age, but on a single day, the day of the Lord, the final judgment, the day of final judgment comes as shown with a vertical arrow. And on the day of the Lord, all the sins will be judged, and from then on, a new world will begin. It is the world that the uh, Old Testament prophesied about. It is the new heaven and earth from the day of the Lord onward. This had been the Jewish expectation of the last days, the first century Jewish eschatology. But unlike this expectation, Christ's resurrection has brought a new picture of history. This world, as represented in green, continues even after the coming of Jesus onto the earth as represented by the blue line on the left. This day of the Lord took place, but this world strangely continues to exist. But this red line, the new world, the new kingdom of God, has broken into the present world, making this present a dual reality. 
In other words, the future has broken into the present. What is to come has already begun. In a sense, we are now living in two worlds at the same time. We are living in this world, but this new kingdom of God has broken into the present world. This dual reality will continue until the second coming of Christ. At the second coming of Christ, this world will cease to exist, and the perfected kingdom of God will remain. This is the new picture of the eschatological history that Jesus' resurrection has drawn. Are you with me? Why is this so? The bodily resurrection of Jesus was not just a return from the dead. Jesus' resurrection was radically different, different from other resurrections, such as Lazarus in John chapter 10. Or, or 11, was it? The resurrection of Lazarus was a mere return from death. When Lazarus came out of the tomb, his hands and feet were wrapped with strips of linen, and his resurrection was truly a return to his previous life, right? However, Jesus' resurrection is very different from that of Lazarus. Jesus' linens were folded up, and his resurrection was not merely a return to his previous life, but into a new kind of existence and appearance. Remember that his disciples were not able to recognize Jesus after his resurrection? It is not just because they never expected him, but also his outer appearance has somewhat changed to a new resurrected body. Remember that Jesus came into a house, like he literally came into a house, when the doors were locked. The resurrected body of Jesus was not a return to the previous life from death. It was rather about entering into a new kind of life through death and through resurrection. That's the resurrection which Jesus experienced as the first fruit in other words, his resurrection was an eschatological resurrection, the one belonging to the new kingdom to come. And this is the significance of Jesus' resurrection. It's not simply a miracle. It's a flare. It's a sign. It's a confirmation, a flare that this declares the beginning of the new age that has broken into the present world. Resurrection is a last day thing. It will surely happen, but only on the last day. Everyone in Christ will be resurrected on the last day, but you know what? In the middle of the history. The world hasn't ended yet, but in the middle of the history, Christ has resurrected already, meaning the future has broken into the present. Presence of the future. His resurrection declares that the new kingdom of God has already begun. And this is not a theory. This is a new reality, reality that the disciples of Jesus finally realized during the 40 days as Jesus was explaining the meaning of his resurrection. Their lives were, cha were changed as soon as they realized this new reality Things are not as they seem. There's a deeper reality that is at work, they realized. The kingdom of God has broken into the present world. Even the physical healings that took place by Jesus and as well as by disciples, these are not just miracles. These are signs that the new kingdom has begun. The promised healing in the future has broken into the present world, confirming the presence of Christ's eternal reign in the present world. So in Acts 1, the disciples call themselves the witnesses of Jesus' resurrection instead of the witnesses of Jesus' cross because a new world has begun with the resurrection of Christ. 
The promised future was that we will abide in His presence, the presence of God. But you know what? The presence of God is already at work. This is my Father's world. Christ reigns today. Things are not as they seem. The kingdom has begun. A new reality is overwrapping the present world. We live in this world, but we belong to the new world. We speak and behave as if we are already living in the new world because we know the future has broken into the present. We observe the rules of the new order, new world to come, not because we want to get, we get the permission to get into the new world, but because we know the new world has come into the present. For this is the gospel of the kingdom. Because of this realization of the kingdom gospel, the disciples' lives were forever changed, as well as their lives, as the lives of the first century followers of Jesus. How do we know? The world was turned upside down because of them, who saw this kingdom that has broken into the world, and even after 2,000 years, we are still talking about it. Then what is the church? If this is the gospel, then what is the church? Should I, or should I say, who is the church in today's world? The church of Christ is the people of God who realize this kingdom gospel, that the kingdom of God has already broken into the world, and then participate in the story. This story of gospel movement, movement that is based on the life of Jesus, and movement that is being driven by the ministries of living and resurrected Jesus in the present world. Let me say that one more time. The church of Christ is the people of God who realize this kingdom gospel and participate in the story. This was exactly what was going on in the first chapter of the book of Revelation as well. Apostle John says, I, John, your brother and companion, companion in, in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus, was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. By that time, about 40,000 Christians had been killed by the time John was writing this. They were thrown into the Colosseums to fight with lions, and they were killed on the streets. Apostle Peter, by that time, was crucified, and Apostle Paul was murdered as well. Christians lost their jobs. Even Apostle John, who was writing this letter, was exiled to the prison island of Pemmus. They did not know how long this situation would continue. There were so, there were so many uncertainties and unknowns instability and traumatic fears, series of turmoil and situational transitions, loneliness, longing for restoration, joy, hope, community, and reconciliation. And in this situation, what John does is he chooses to worship Jesus. Look, chapter, look at the chapter 1, verse 10. On the Lord's day, on a Sunday morning, I was in the Spirit, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet. Yes, John chose to worship Jesus on this Sunday morning because he knows, because of the kingdom gospel that he realizes that things are not as they seem. There's a deeper reality in play. And the Lord Jesus reveals a vision to this apostle through which he's reminded of who Jesus is and who this John is and his fellow church means to the, to the Lord. Jesus shows John a picture and lets him hear the sound. So Revelation is like a picture book where Jesus reveals some images so that John understands by looking at them as symbols, picture book. And the very first vision that John saw was a person, someone like a son of man, someone like a son of man. When we hear the word son of man, it sounds very human in contrast to son of God, which sounds more divine. But as a matter of fact, the opposite is true. The New Testament Israelites were used to identify themselves as the children of God, in other words, sons and daughters of God, meaning it was a generic and common phrase referring to God's people, son of God. 
On the other hand, son of man had a specific meaning and historical connotation as the phrase is from the book of Daniel in the Old Testament. As you may know, Daniel 7 is a vision that Daniel describes about this cosmic Messiah who is going to rule over the nations and kingdoms. And the phrase he uses is the Son of Man, which indicates the Lord, the Messiah, over the nations and history. Daniel states that this Son of Man was given authority, glory, and sovereign power, and all nations and people of every language worshipped him. Meaning that both Daniel and John are seeing the Messiah through this image of the Son of Man, who rules over the nations and history. And the following verses describe and symbolize that the Messiah's characters and power using the Old Testament languages and symbolisms of the first century. But the most important message from this vision has to do with where this Son of Man is standing, where this Son of Man is standing. Verse 13, among the lampstands was someone like a Son of Man. Among the lampstands was someone like a Son of Man. This Messiah over the nations and history is present. He's standing among the lamp stands. He's not absent in the scene. He's not absent from the world. He's not neglecting the world nor the situations of his people. He's standing there. He's present and he's not silent. Then what are the lamp stands? Verse 11, John was commissioned to deliver this vision to the seven churches in Asia Minor. And at the very end of the vision, Jesus clarifies what these seven lampstands stand for. Verse 20, the very last sentence of the verse. The seven lampstands are the seven churches. Can you imagine this, literally imagine this? In the midst of the seven gold, golden lampstands, what is Jesus saying? John, I am in the midst of my church. I'm in the midst of your situation. I understand your hardship and challenges, but you know what? I am still in control. I am the history maker, and I am the Lord over the nations. Things are not as they seem. I am alive. I am the beginning and the end. I am with you even in the prison island of Patmos where you might think nothing can happen from there. I am still with you and I'm working through you to reveal myself to the world. My kingdom has begun and I will bring it about to its completion. That's what Jesus is saying. Yes, this is the kingdom gospel in action. Jesus is still on the move. He's working in and through his church, standing in the midst of the seven lamp stands. And this vision was to be given to the seven churches in Asia Minor in a form of a circulating letter. It wasn't a seven different letters, but a circulating letter that goes to many churches. As you read in chapters 2 and 3 of the book of Revelation, we know that these are not perfect churches, those seven churches. Some needed repentance. Some lost their first love. Some had moral and doctrinal failures. Some had a reputation of being alive but were actually dead in faith. Some, some were lukewarm. But surprise, surprise. The resurrected Jesus is still standing in their midst, in the midst of seven lampstands. This does not mean that Jesus is fine and okay with wherever they are and whatever they do and however they perform, but rather that his persistent love and zeal will one day bring about healing and restoration in the churches. The seven churches. There were many other churches in the Asia Minor beside these seven churches, such as Colossae. And I'm sure they also read this letter in circulation. But what seven means, the number seven means here in the book of uh, Revelation uh, is a symbol. It's a symbol of unity and completion. And there are all different churches with different callings, characteristics, location, and goals then and today. But they were to keep in mind that each of them 
is a part of the universal global church, the movement that Jesus is leading. So Jesus is shifting their focus from what is just in front of their eyes, my family, my church, my situation, my hardship, my suffering, and forth, so forth, to this global cosmic vision for the church of Jesus, what Jesus is doing through his church in this moment in history. That's what's going on in the first chapter of the book of Revelation. Village is a part of the global church of, church of Jesus. Yes, we are located in, located in a suburban area of a town, which is just one of millions of towns in the world. But we must have a mindset of the global church. We are together a part of this universal body of Christ living and working in today's world across all nations and places. Although the length of our days is 70 years or 80 or some more or some less, which is just a tiny glimpse in the history of the humankind and the cosmos, we are, by all means, joining the forerunners as well as the generations to come as a participant in the history of the kingdom of Jesus. Back in 1974, leaders of global churches were convened in Lausanne, Switzerland, to reflect on this glorious vocation and to commit ourselves together for world evangelization. These were the churches that believe in the authority and power of Scripture, believe in the uniqueness and supremacy of Christ, and believe in the empowering presence and ministry of the Holy Spirit through the global church. This movement was pioneered by Billy Graham and John Stott, resulting in the Lausanne Covenant. Lausanne Covenant, which can be summarized in the following phrase. It is the whole church that takes the whole gospel to the whole world. It is the whole church that takes the whole gospel, not a partial gospel, the whole gospel to the whole world. Whole church, whole gospel, whole world. And this is regarded as one of the most significant conventions and documents and covenants in modern church history. And this movement has continued through the Manila Manifesto in the Philippines back in 1989 and to the Cape Town commitment in South Africa back in 2010 as well as to the fourth historic convention, which is to be held in Seoul, South Korea, in 2024. Back in 2010, thousands of leaders from 198 nations convened, including some of our own villagers, to profess our faith in the living Jesus at work and to commit ourselves for unity, integrity, and faithfulness for Jesus and his kingdom. This story is being, still being written, and I want us to know that we are a part of this story together. So village, this is who we are in history, and the gospel we are entrusted with. We are not here to be served, but to serve the Lord over the nations and history. Your life is not accidental, but providential. Our community is not a random community in which everyone has exactly the same preferences and interests, nor is it a social club. But we are here because we have seen the resurrected Lord. It's because we have heard the story, the gospel, because we have realized the kingdom that has broken into the present world. We are here to pray your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. So this is the second core value of our community, a principle to live by. We are here to deepen the global gospel movement. Let me read the official description of this core value. We believe in the gospel of the kingdom of God proclaimed by Jesus Christ. We believe that it is the gospel of the kingdom that brings about a beautiful world, a glorious church, and a life 
worth living for God's glory. We dedicate ourselves to witnessing the gospel of the kingdom in this tension of already but not yet. As outlined by the Lausanne movement, we believe in the authority and power of Scripture and believe in the uniqueness and supremacy of Christ. We believe in the empowering presence and ministry of the Holy Spirit through the global church. Amen to that? When Saul was on his way to Damascus, the resurrected Jesus appeared to him and said, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? As you know, Saul had never met Jesus when Jesus was alive, nor did he persecute Jesus. What Saul persecuted was the church. Yet Jesus said, why do you persecute me? Here Jesus is identifying his church with himself. Meaning when you suffer for Christ, Christ suffers with you. When you rejoice for Christ, Christ rejoices with you. When your life is lived out for the kingdom, Christ is living through your life. That is who you are and who we are in this mysterious but truthful new reality. Things are not as they seem. The kingdom of God has broken into the present world and the future is brought into the present. So will you continue to live your life for the world that is soon to be ended? Or will you start living your life in the eternal kingdom that has already begun? May we join with the forerunners and the generations to come in representing Jesus and his kingdom. For we have seen the living and resurrected Jesus. Amen.